I don't believe that I need to explain what anime is to you, because chances are if you're watching this right now, you probably have at least three shelves full of strangely proportioned vinyl figurines, as well as a body pillow that crinkles like a bag of chips whenever you touch it for some reason. But Japanimation, like most great art, has transcended mere geographical borders to become a cultural touchstone. Anime has become a fixture in our daily lives in a way that's really hard to ignore. From the shoes we wear to the food we eat, the posters we hang up on our walls, the friends we've made, and the AMVs that we're embarrassed to have created. But beyond being the muse for some of the most talented Windows Movie Maker artisans, anime properties also serve as the inspiration for a legacy of video games that's about as old as the medium itself. And this being a channel that mostly discusses fighting games, I wanted to take a look at a specific cross-section of both anime and fighting game. The Anime Arena Fighter. Because despite massive brand popularity, huge sales, and dozens of games spanning multiple console generations, Anime Arena Fighters don't gain any respect as serious competitive games within the fighting game community. And if we're being honest, no respect within any gaming community. Because any time that a game featuring a fresh young anime IP is even speculated to be an arena fighter, there's always a massive pushback from people who just don't want to see it. The subgenre itself is an albatross upon the neck of all of these games, and I wanted to explore why. But before we do that, let's hear from today's... First, let's clarify the difference between arena fighters and more traditional fighting games, because I've seen a lot of people who just don't understand the gameplay implications that those differences introduce. To put it simply, in fighting games, your movement is directly relative to your opponent. If you're on the right, the left input on the joystick will send you walking forwards. If you're on the left, the left input will send you backwards. You can sidestep in 3D fighting games like Soul Calibur and Tekken, but you'll always be facing towards the enemy, creating a center line on which combat takes place. After all, in a real-life fight, you probably don't want to turn your back on somebody looking to bash your face in. But depending on who you ask, anime isn't real life and their take on fighting games reflects that, giving you a full 360 degree range of movement. And this one difference has a pretty massive implication on how these games are played. Since every direction on the stick is used for movement, you can't crouch block or hold back to block since the back direction changes all the time. That means these games use a smash style shielding system that eliminates high-low and left-right blocking. Second, the camera. In more traditional fighters, characters are parallel to each other at all times, which means that the camera can focus on the center point between the two and zoom in and out at will to keep both players in frame. In your average anime arena fighter, that can't really be done, since the center point changes so often because of the aforementioned completely free movement. It also means that precision spacing is a lot tougher thanks to a camera system that has to follow one character like they were in an action game, creating an inherent imbalance between the visual information that player one and player two are getting at any one point. But while these are problems for a lot of anime arena fighters, they've been solved by either adding split-screen functionality or a LAN mode where both players get their own screen to themselves. So they're not really the backbreakers that keep the entire subgenre from getting out of the just-for-fun category. That is a job for my good friend Depth. Depth is a concept in game design circles that's often defined as the amount of interesting, meaningful decisions that a player could make at any point during the course of playing a game, all the way from character select until a winner is decided. If said game is made in such a way where there's only one or two viable sequences of moves that'll work in a given scenario, or if the decisions you make just aren't interesting, then that game suffers from a lack of depth. Tic-Tac-Toe is the classical example of this because the number of interesting choices at the top level of play is zero because there's no meaningful deviation that can be made from optimal play without straight up losing. <laughs> depth is incredibly important for fighting games, because without depth, they become bland, stale, and more boring than your average shonen anime protagonist. Whoops, did I say that out loud? Arena fighters are widely considered to be lacking in the depth department, so much so that a development goal to make a deep arena fighting game has become a selling point, rather than something that's just to be expected. So I purchased and played a bunch of these games over the last few weeks, and I wanted to mention a few things that I've seen in more of a few of these games that I don't believe lend themselves to incredibly deep strategic experiences. And the first thing that really stood out to me is how some of these games are designed to give both players artificial opportunities to press buttons, at the cost of in-match decision-making. If you've ever played somebody brand new to fighting games and subsequently wiped the floor with them, you might have heard them say that they never felt like they had the opportunity to play. 
Chances are you were just able to smash them over and over again on Wake Up in route to a perfect KO. That's not really an option for these more casual focused fighters, so some of them will fudge the Wake Up game to ensure that everyone has a fair shot. By either giving you enough invincibility frames to get you through breakfast and your morning coffee before fully waking up, or giving you something better to do instead of pressing your advantage. Like how some games tie advanced movement techniques and attack options to your meter, but don't replenish that bar at a reasonable rate, forcing you to let your opponent on their feet while you do the incredibly anime thing of yelling into the sky in order to get your bar back to cover all of your options. Second, Combo Breakers. I don't have a problem with them and their ilk whenever they have a reasonable risk-reward trade-off. In Guilty Gear, you'll almost never get more than one or two get-out-of-jail-free bursts over the course of an entire game. And in Killer Instinct, guessing wrong means the dunking of a lifetime. Not only that, but there's also a significant amount of counterplay through burst baits and counter breakers that make the choice of when to and when not to break a huge decision for the player being comboed. The more safety nets you have, the less interesting and deep that choice becomes. Anime Arena Fighters not only double down on that by giving you more chances to stuff combos than me after a long night of drinking, they take it one step further by putting the person who was on the defensive in the driver's seat in the very next interaction. This at best forces players to take an immediate guess that doesn't depend on much more than a static game of rock, paper, scissors, and at worst, punishes the player who won the initial exchange in neutral. Combo breakers work at all because they reset both players to a neutral state, forcing them to earn their way back to an advantage through solid play in neutral. But it's no mystery why breakers are designed this way either. Getting comboed and losing control because you made a bad choice is tough for even the most experienced fighting game players. So letting casual gamers have a button they can press to skip the trauma makes sense if you're trying to make a game that anyone has a shot of winning at. But also, a lot of these games kind of need to design breakers like that, because if they didn't, entire matches would be over in a maximum of two touches because of easy access to ridiculously high damage. And that, I believe, speaks to the genre's hesitancy to embrace complexity. If you've ever heard arena fighters called button mashy, or if you've ever wondered why everybody in these games plays the same, you could blame that on a lack of complexity. Think of it as the amount of stuff that a game asks you to keep track of at any one time. When a Tekken combo looks like this, and an Arena Fighter combo looks like this, you know you're dealing with two very different levels of required game knowledge. Whether it's character-specific tools and ranges, frame data, combo options, UI elements, the way you input special moves, and even something as pedestrian as whether or not a stage has a corner or walls counts towards a layer of complexity. Of course, fighting games don't need to be complex in order to be deep, but what complexity there is should open the door for players looking to implement those tools into their game plans. Smash Melee is a great example of this. It's a pretty simple game, but when 1930s oil baron Zacharias Melee invented wave dashing, it led to the discovery of even more advanced movement techniques, which gave his game the depth that it needed to last well beyond the Taft administration. However, complexity comes at a cost. The more of it you add, the more of a skill gap forms between beginners and the people who've spent the time to understand that complexity. Everything else equal, given two opponents who make generally similar decisions, the winner more often than not will be the person who knows how to squeeze slightly more out of a combo or knows how to create favorable situations for themselves. This also means that it takes more time to get good enough to really feel like you're playing with intentionality. Arena fighters in many cases go in the opposite direction, removing as much complexity as possible in order to build a big tent for their player base. This serves a threefold purpose. One to narrow the skill gap as much as possible. This is a big reason why arena fighters aren't taken seriously as competitive games. A tight skill gap means more variance in outcome, which makes a game feel random, and therefore less worthy of spending thousands of hours on. Two, they don't want to run into the problem of a casual player not understanding how to play their favorite character, which is why so many damn arena fighters feature entire rosters that either have similar combo structures, attack ranges, or are balanced based on their canonical strength from their shows. Because if every character has the same playstyle, or if every special move fills the same purpose, the only thing you could really adjust is raw power. 
and three, the simple nature of these character designs makes it much easier to push out rosters with hundreds of characters with new DLC added by the dozen. And this is, I think, the biggest thing that sticks in the craw of both people looking for a high level of competition and casual anime fans who pray that their favorite show gets the Dragon Ball Fighters treatment. Anime shows come ready-made with a diverse cast of characters with unique powers and strong personalities. They're practically a fighting game character factory in themselves, which is why it's always frustrating when an arena fighter comes out, looks at all of the potential, and just says... No, 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 no. The most fun that I have watching battle-focused animes is thinking about how different characters would be designed if their powers were translated into a normal one-on-one -on -one fighting game. Like Haku from Naruto Part 1, who I think could play like a combination of Chip from Guilty Gear, Yurian from Street Fighter, and Garagos from Killer Instinct, who could use setups using his mirrors on what would eventually become the Great Naruto Bridge. And then I play the character in Ninja Storm. And while that game does have more than you'd expect under the hood for how simple it is, it still doesn't lead me to make the strategic decisions I feel are befitting of that character in much the same way that it feels incredible to open somebody up using Nappa's Cyberman or Yamcha's Wolf Fang Fist. In other words, arena fighters have the habit of delivering a lot of the wow, but not a lot of the why. Reducing complexity and upping the production value, but not supplementing their systems with a lot of variety which ends up making a lot of the games in the genre feel kinda samey. Hey, I'm invading! Maybe it's a reach, but I think there are strategic reasons for companies to make anime fighters the way they do. Making a competitive game is tough, and it's something that's only recently become more widely understood. Frame data, hitboxes, balancing, fundamentals, there's a lot to figure out, and frankly, when management says you're making a licensed anime game, there's a way better way to handle things than by putting in monumental amounts of effort. Just don't. Anime fighters care about style over substance, they care about winking at fans, about including the original voice cast, about animating every frame of that special move every fan loves. Because at the end of the day, shooting giant laser beams is awesome! And they know the game will do well enough as long as it's not complete crap and the right characters are playable. Even if it's a disservice to competitive gamers, that's a puny fraction of the market. Smash Ultimate, for example, didn't become the best-selling fighter by being the most well-crafted, well-balanced game, even if it's trying. And yeah, like K-Bash said, it's no secret why this kind of paint-by-numbers design exists. Fighting games are incredibly expensive and difficult to make and to make well. A good fighting game needs to have both a creative vision and design goal that aligns with a hardcore competitive audience, which requires an experienced team who's been around the block a few times. It's no surprise that a game like Dragon Ball Fighters is quality when it has a battle director who's had a decade's worth of experience in making games in the genre. And it's not surprising that Pokémon Tournament is considered one of the better arena fighters out there when that game has the full weight of Namco Bandai's fighting game division in its corner. Those studios are unicorns, rare and elusive, so publishers would rather just avoid the risk entirely of making a bad game that attempts to appeal to the hardcore and gives titles to less experienced fighting game developers who don't need to make the world's deepest fighting game, because their only goal is to make a fan experience that relies on getting everybody to a level of competency quick enough to enjoy competitive games with friends. And you can see that inexperience in the little things, like a training mode without many good options, or health bars that drain outward instead of inward towards the timer, super animations that are like 30 seconds long, blatant balance issues, or how both Player 1 and Player 2 can't pick their characters at the same time. But the funny thing is that none of that actually matters to the target audiences of these games. It doesn't matter if tapping the jab button in a game like Jump Force sends you halfway across the ring, or if everyone moves at exactly the same speed. It doesn't really matter if that has implications on the neutral game or makes delicate spacing all but impossible, as long as that doesn't get in the way of the enjoyment of casual players. But you know, it isn't all bad. The camera and free movement of arena fighters do often cause issues for one-on-one -on -one matches, but I think those exact same mechanics work way better for something that traditional fighting games have never and likely will ever be able to pull off. And that's a fun team-based fighting game experience. 
Team fighting games have always been kind of a meme since you can't really play them simultaneously against more than one person, but games like the Mobile Suit Gundam vs. series and Final Fantasy to Cydia don't really need to be the most complex out there because the team dynamic adds such a rich layer of strategy that it counteracts any mechanical simplicity. Free movement works way better when you actually have a choice of which target you want to pursue. And the presence of an opposing teammate means you always need to be thinking about where they are in relation to you, when you should break away from a fight, when you need to cover your teammates, and a whole lot of other important factors that add up to incredibly satisfying gameplay. But for my money, my favorite anime arena fighter is the one that actually managed to engage me in the same way that a fighting game does. That sounds like a no-brainer, but when I was playing Kill la Kill If, I felt myself wanting to hop into the training mode to learn the optimal combos and how to avoid the setups that just kept clipping me over and over again because there's just enough meat to the gameplay itself that allows for that kind of exploration. For a rookie fighting game developer who likely made their game on a shoestring budget, it's truly impressive how much gameplay diversity a games had stuffed into Kill la Kill If's 12 character roster. Everyone has different win conditions, combo routes, and pressure strings that can be mixed and matched to suit whatever situation's happening at any given point, aka a fighting game. All of this goes without mentioning a surprisingly robust movement system, which at the top level looks as close to 3D Marvel vs. Capcom as I'd ever seen. The game is incredibly dope, but unfortunately it suffers from a bit of a population issue which is why close to the release of this video, I'll give away some copies on my Twitter and Twitch accounts. I don't really have a way to wrap this video up other than saying that it's super obvious who arena fighters are made for. Anime fans who just want nothing more than to grind out a few games to their, I, I mean, with their favorite waifu, and that's okay. Not every game needs to be this tournament level fighter. If you're having fun, I'm happy that you're enjoying yourself. But if you do want to push your favorite arena fighter to the next level, see if there's an online community who runs regular tournaments. The Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm, My Hero One's Justice, and Kill a Kill Lift communities, I'm sure, would be happy to have the extra players. Thank you to everyone who's made it this far in the video. As usual, if you're watching close to when this video's first uploaded, I'll be celebrating with y'all on my Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash stumblebee. I hope to see you there. Thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video, and please consider subscribing to my channel if you enjoyed this video.